Hello, we're here with Sarah Nelson, who is running for Seattle City Council. Would you like to go ahead with your uh, one minute introduction? Sure. Uh, for people that haven't seen my other speech, I am a progressive small business owner and uh, I'm running for city council because I'm concerned about city council, we're at, we have about Seattle. We're at a critical juncture and I believe that my experience, both as a staffer for one of the most progressive city council members way back in the last decade, and my experience starting a small business, Vermont Brewing, you know, treating our employees right, making payroll, uh, making a good product and a community asset, which is a gathering place, make me the, the right fit um, for the job at the, at the right time uh, to get government done the way it's supposed to be. You know, the job of a citywide council member is first and foremost, constituent services and solving problems. And we don't need a council member focused on, um, you know, global politics, we need a council member who's focused on quality of life, improving the lives of people who pays attention I'm to the utility bill and um, who really wants to reconnect with real I'm Sarah. in real life. Okay, thank you so much. All right, so now we're gonna go into our four prepared questions and our order is Paula, Mackenzie, John Barry, and then Alice. And I am going to post the questions into the chat as well so you can follow along with us. So Paula, would you like to go ahead and read the first question? Thank you, Nicole, and welcome, Sarah. Uh, what would you do to address systemic racism, including that within the criminal justice system? Well, to adjust, systemic racism in in every single uh, facet of city policy, um, you know, means going down and, and at the very minimum using the race and social justice toolkit, but mostly it's it's having a deep understanding of of the uh, the root causes and and how uh, racism plays out. What are its real life day to day impacts in society to do that I will I um, I have to listen to people find out, ask them, what can I do for you? And then figure out a way to do it. So it really does uh, matter that I take meetings and pick up the phone and build relationships. That is first and foremost, a city council member's job. And that's what I'll be focused on. Now, when it comes to uh, the criminal justice system, we have, <laughs> yes, we need to reform the police in a way though, that, uh, that ensures public safety and that holds officers accountable for, for misconduct and that builds trust with community. And that's what I see as missing. And, and um, I believe that uh, we need to rebuild our community police teams because that served as a, as a, as a fundamental bridge between uh, residents, businesses, and, and law enforcement. So that's first and foremost. And then second, one of the things that I've been proposing that I, that I hope can be focused on is recruiting and retaining officers from the communities that they will eventually serve. This will overcome language barriers, cultural barriers, and again, build trust and improve accountability. There are a lot of other things that we can be doing, um, but that is the, uh, unfortunately, the locked box of the police, uh, uh, the, the renewed SPOG contract. And we should tie um, we should tie the renewal of that contract with meeting the, uh, the the terms of the consent decree. Great, thank you. All right, I'm going to post a second question into the chat. And Mackenzie, if you would take this one, please. Great. Yes. Okay. So the bridges, such as Magnolia and Ballard, in the 36th legislative district, require upgrades and or replacements. What are your plans to address these important maritime freight corridors? Thank you for this question. Uh, as someone who has a business in the uh, maritime industrial core of Ballard, I, I appreciate this question. And what we have to do is focus our investments on infrastructure. Our first priority should be maintaining and, um, and repairing our roads, bridges, all of our public infrastructure before taking on new expenses. And, and so that will be my policy orientation going forward. And uh, when it comes to those bridges, 
why are we still talking about this now? Uh, the Magnolia Bridge was, you know, was damaged in the Nisqually earthquake before I came on council in 2002, and we're still talking about it. I support um, replacing that bridge where it is now and getting um, and, and getting money from the port and the state and federal infrastructure dollars to do that. Uh, much sooner rather than later. And why did the West Seattle Bridge have to be emergency closed one afternoon? That was lack of oversight. And council can play a much better role in ensuring that our um, our departments are on top of things and and in tracking and investing in the capital improvement program. And so I will never cut um, cut projects that are in the CIP. And I will be looking um, over, especially those departments that are under my purview, to make sure that we're not falling further behind. We have got to um, you know, fill this maintenance backlog and ensure that future investments um, are focused primarily on our infrastructure. Great, thank you. Uh, now we'll go into question number three. And John, if you could take that one. You're still on mute. Uh, sorry about that. Um, in 2020, uh, 5.8 million was cut from the library system, uh, which laid off 58 people. Uh, will you work to restore those funds and why or why not? I will absolutely work with those to restore those funds. The, um, the charter says that we, you know, the, the job of local government is to deliver the five basic services, police, fire, parks, libraries, and transportation. It is unconscionable that that money was cut. It was used for something else, but it has not been restored. And I've spoken to people that, um, you know, the, the foundation, and I've learned that the, uh, the library levy uh, has now taken on 39% of the library's operating budget. It wasn't supposed to go over 25. And the more we pile into the, um, to, uh, onto the levy, the more we take out of the general fund for pet projects and, and rely on levies, the more property taxes go up and the more displacement we have. So yes, I am focused on adequately funding our essential basic city services, including the library, but especially because that is, um, a, you know, that is one of the most used public services and it's key to our um, democracy and meeting our social justice goals. It, the, the library provides uh, computers and other services, filling out job applications, for example, that people who don't have the means rely on. Thank you very much. And now we'll move into question number four. And Alice, if you could take that one. Get off mute this time. Um, that was my problem last time. This is a citywide position. If elected, how will you balance the different and often competing needs of your constituents, including individuals and businesses? Well, like I said in my intro, uh, the job of a city council member is to represent the 770 people living in Seattle. And to do that, I need to focus on, um, first of all, making sure that I answer phone calls and meet with people. Too often I feel that council, you, you won't get a phone call, you won't get an email until the legislation is passed. So I want people out there who are watching this video to know that that will not be me. I will have an open door policy and my job is to ask you, what do you want? What do you need? And then figure out a way how to do it. Um, we also need a council member who basically just reconnects with folks and and uh, is paying attention to the to the basics of of the job. How to balance those needs? Well, first of all, I'm not going to be a gatekeeper and just checking the boxes of the familiar names and faces that always get meetings and and get heard in council um, briefings, etc. And uh, I will be meeting with businesses and neighborhood organizations and making sure that I understand the trade-offs of the policies that are being proposed by both sides. It, government is hard work and it requires balance, but um, I think that, the, that there is a place where we can all come together on the progressive values that the vast majority of Seattleites and business owners in this town share and find where, um, where we can meet in that place. 
and it's all about issues of quality of life. It's about jobs. It's about, um, it's about uh, like I've said, the basic services. And it's about our economic recovery, forging an equitable economic recovery that doesn't leave people behind. And then finally, um, making and sure that, uh, that, our, uh, that our economy is meeting I, the needs of the people that live here. Great, thank you so much. And now we'll open the uh, floor up to uh, follow-up questions that folks may have. And the responses to these are one minute, one minute apiece. Are there any follow-up questions? I have a follow-up question, if I can. Go ahead, uh, John, and then we'll have Mackenzie after you. Uh, how are you going to recruit police from the local community? Uh, they've been trying that for a long time, and it just hasn't worked. What what magic uh, potion are you going to use to uh, be able to recruit folks from various Seattle neighborhoods? Yeah, <laughs> that is a challenge because the salary of a police officer is it's difficult to live in Seattle on on that salary. But but back let me let, take us back to 2018. Um, uh, business licenses and and um, and uh, uh, yeah, business licenses. And there was there were a couple of things were raised in order to provide money to recruit new officers. And there were um, the push was let's recruit officers um, and, and get a more diverse force. And we did that and we had the officers and then came um, council's call to defund by 50%. And many of those officers either quit or were laid off. And so we have to have um, better retention tools and it, and it comes down to what message is council sending about how much we value our police force. Bye. And then um, secondly, we're going to have to incentivize recruitment, and I have, Time. and I, you Time. know, we might have to, you know, fifteen hundred dollars and thousand dollars. Okay, recruit. thank you. Anyway, all right, uh, let's move on to Mackenzie, and then following that, we'll do Sherry and then Andy. Thanks. Hi, sir. Um, a question I have is involves the um, the army where the National Guard is at over. Um, in the inner bay area so they are eventually going to be leaving there's a lot of public debate about what to do with that land which is about 25 acres worth after they are gone so i was curious of your thoughts on that of um kind of the, what side of the fence you feel on that or, or uh, you know what to do with that land after they are gone so i it's been a while since i've been familiar with this issue when i was in richard's office this did come up i don't know what project is right now planned i do however know that we've got we've got two issues we've got um a housing affordability crisis so we need more housing and we also have a finite amount of industrial lands so i would need to know more about um you know what will how what is the zoning proposal for that land because we need to preserve industrial lands. However, um, it depends on how will that land be used once the, um, the armory is moved. So I am basically saying that I do need to understand this issue more, understand what are the real projects that are on, on you know, that are being proposed, if any concrete projects are, are in the pipeline. But um, those are my values. We need more housing and we also do need I've, to make sure that we preserve land for our maritime economy. Great, Time. thank you. Uh, Sherry, go ahead. Hi, um, I have a follow-up question. Um, what would you, specifically, what would you cut or how would you increase revenue in order to restore the library services or and other city services that have been cut? That happens every budget season with um, with decisions that are made. Uh, and so if I am elected, I if there is not a um, already uh, in the mayor's budget that is passed down to the council, if there is not already money to um, to bring up the uh, the operating budget of the libraries, I will propose it and I will oppose any other cuts to um, to basics uh, services. 
So it's all about, I don't know if they call them green sheets anymore, but basically I'll be a leader at council in restoring those funds to the library and making sure that um, we're not cutting other basic services. Like let's not eliminate one of the four tree trimming crews in SDOT, et cetera. These things matter. They touch people's lives every single day. And um, every time we, uh, that we, and um, Every time we make decisions that take money out of the general fund that pays for basic I, services, we risk um, undermining our basic services delivery. Time. Great. Thank you. Andy, go ahead. Hi. Um, how do you plan on involving residents in the decision making process um, in our town? Okay. Um, so, the, dis the, uh, the dismantlement of the district council system has left a void. And there are some district councils that have carried on and community councils have a way of, of, uh, of advancing their concerns and, and ideas and proposals. And then in other parts of the city that, that does not exist anymore. So um, the problem, and so basically we've got an uneven um, access to the uh, to staffers in our various departments to share information and to respond to community needs. So when you talk about how will I involve neighborhoods, I think that we've that we have to really consider rebuilding the whole the you know the Department of Neighborhoods and, and the ways in which <clears throat> the community interacts with um, with city staffers. I so to be continued, but um, this is a concern of mine. Great, thank you. Any further um, questions? I'll ask my Nicole. Go ahead, Paula. Sarah, I drive down 4th Avenue from Magnolia to the Central District every morning, and I drive back every night. And if you were riding with me, and my eight-year-old asked the question, Mom, why are there so many tents on the street? How would you help me answer that for her? I would say um, our leaders have failed. What the tents on the street is a manifestation of um, a humanitarian and a policy failure, and continuing to do the same thing is it, it isn't going to make it any better. We have got to focus on getting people into housing and the services that they need. And the the reason that there are tents on the sidewalk is because. Um, I believe that uh, people are afraid to do something different. And um, I will have the political will to put in place or to, to propose putting in place a model that works in other cities that have decreased their population of chronically homeless. It, it's inhumane. And, we, and, and the fact that the conversation has devolved into sweeps or no sweeps is basically a smokescreen for just not doing anything. And so I would just tell your, your daughter that unfortunately Hi. our city leaders have no plan and uh, we've got to get one. Time. Great, thank you. And we have time for one more question. And I got some questions from members as well here. So I can ask one of those. Um, I know one of them, the Magnolia I'm Ballard Bridge was from a member as well. Um, this one is about defining ownership of an issue. So uh, they wanted to know, how would you define ownership of an issue? And uh, what is the rankings to measure your next term by? Like, uh, like I guess like a measurement of, of success, essentially, I think is what the question is asking. Um, so how would you define ownership of an issue? And how would uh, we be able to tell if uh, things went well for your next term? Well, um, I think a, a huge measure of success will be um, a, a drastically reduced number of people living in tents on Fourth Avenue and around the city. So um, that is the, the big challenge right now. And I think that that, uh, that will be a defining measure of success for any council member in four years. 
Um, another measure is rebuilding trust between police and the community by uh, renegotiating a good contract that has better disciplinary protocols so that um, so that bad cops are not left let off the hook and uh, so that people feel safe so that we can bring down the uh, the time it takes for 911 to arrive at your house if someone's breaking in right now well a couple months ago it was 14 minutes so so people feeling safer and and um and a reduction in crime and also people I people feeling as though they are part of our uh, equitable recovery. Right. Great, thank you so much. And with that, uh, would you like to go ahead and give a one minute wrap up? Well, I think that the stakes are high this election and the, uh, and the choice is really clear. Um, and the, the choice is between the same old sort of uh, basically lack of plan and, and rhetoric or someone who actually has very defined policy proposals that will, um, that will improve people's lives and, 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 and move the needle on, on the challenges that we've spent the past 20 minutes talking about. And I want to be that person. I am endorsed by, um, by the Seattle Times, the firefighters, the Building and Construction Trades Council, the iron workers, the plumbers, and um, police reform leaders, uh, Reverend Harriet Walden and Victoria Beach for, uh, for because I agree with their, um, their ideas on reforming the police and building in more accountability. So and the fact that there are um, uh, a diversity of organizations and, and people I, that support me uh, show that I must be on the right track and I, I hope for the support fine. of the 36th. Great, thank you so much.